Welcome, everyone. This is the fourth lecture of this semester, and it will be our uh, last one until spring semester. I want to thank our sponsors, who include the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, Graduate School of Oceanography has helped, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Rhode Island chapter of the ASLA, and the um, playground manufacturer, Landscape Forms. I want to thank our students, our sophomore set, for our reception this evening. Thank you, thank you, and thank you wherever else you are. Uh, if anyone wants to receive an announcement about the lecture series, you can email me, but there might be 25 other places to just Google the lecture series. Tonight we are honored to have Steve Benz with us. Uh, Steve is a Rhode Islander. And he receives his, his BS from Roger Williams, and he's a professional engineer. Steve's a nationally recognized expert uh, with more than 35 years of experience in sustainable site engineering and design, who has contributed to the fields of landscape architecture, engineering, and green infrastructure. He's pioneered new developments in sustainable rainwater management and applied his expertise on many award-winning projects many of which you're with which you are probably familiar and the projects run the gamut from master plans to site details and construction documentation steve has been a partner and director of green infrastructure at olin in philadelphia since 2010 and prior to that he was a principal at sasaki associates uh, where he was in their office on sustainable solutions. Prior to that, he was with Judith Nith, Nitch Engineering, also in Boston, for uh, many years. He's been engineering professional work for 35 years. His portfolio of projects include a diversity of project types, and I'll just mention three. Croon Hall in New Haven, Connecticut, is a certified lead platinum building for new construction. Washington Canal Park in Washington, D.C. is LEED certified and a sustainable sites initiative pilot project, so it's a new program. And then Patchwork is one of Olin's award-winning entries to the International Living Future Institute's Living City Design Competition. He was the founding chair of the U.S. Green Building Council in the Massachusetts chapter and served for seven years on the U.S. Green Building Council's Sustainable Sites Technical Advisory Group, which he also chaired for the last two years. He remains a subject matter, I thought this was going to be hard, a subject matter expert for the Technical Advisory Group and has been appointed to the Water Efficiency Technical Advisory Group, and the Sustainable Sites Technical Core Committee. So he's certainly sought after for his engineering and green infrastructure expertise. He's written many articles and given lectures at national conferences. As we discussed at dinner tonight, he was planning on going as a visitor and an observer to the ASLA National Meeting in Denver, which will be in a week and a half or so, and he said, uh, he's been added to three different presentations there. So it'll be a work a few days as well as observing. So he's spoken at ASLA, he's taught, um, he's been an instructor at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. He's taught at um, University of Pennsylvania and he's lectured at universities all around the country and we have had him as a visitor, as a guest critic, in a few of our studios. We're very pleased to have Steve Benz with us this evening. Will you please welcome Steve Benz? Thanks, Mark. 
Thanks, and I'm exhausted just listening to that. Um, it's good to know that uh, even though 35 years later I haven't been on that side of the, the podium, but um, some things never change and the front rows never fill up. So <laughs> it's comforting. Um, I would like to talk to you tonight about resiliency and uh, design and frame it in terms of what we call the triple bottom line, that is the social, economic, and environmental impact of our work. Um, I'm going to use some Olin projects because they're near and dear to my heart, uh, including Washington Canal Park in Washington, D.C., uh, a project we call Green Over Gray, which is dealing with the combined sewer overflow problem in Cleveland, as well as uh, our award-winning and uh, competition-winning work with Rebuild by Design that uh, we call Lifelines. So those three projects will be the subject of some uh, examples that I'll, that I'll talk about tonight. Uh, begin with uh, lifelines. Hunt, the Hunts Point area in DC, uh, DC in New York, sorry, uh, was the subject of our exploration with the Rebuild by Design competition. I presume you have some familiarity with Rebuild, as your, some of your prior speakers have uh, also uh, told you their projects from uh, from the competition. But basically, a competition uh, posed by the Housing and Urban Development. Uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development from the federal government that asked what can be done in the areas affected by Hurricane Sandy uh, from two years ago. What can be done to design an environment that might make um, uh, uh, less of an, uh, a problem next time? How can the area become more resilient by implementing des design solutions? So they issued a challenge, and it was a very interesting challenge because it wasn't uh, one uh, of a typical design challenge, which might be, um, here's a problem, go solve it. It was what is our problem? First and foremost, what is our problem? Then why is it our problem? And then what do we do about it? But not what do we do about it, what do we do about designing our way around it? So a very interesting challenge, and it's been uh, over the last year or so. Uh, it, we, we chose to focus on an area in the South Bronx shown on the plan, which is the, the location of the food market district uh, in, in New York. Um, regionally important, up to 60% of New York's supply of produce, meat, and fish come from and through uh, Hunts Point Market area, Fulton Fish Market, the uh, produce market and the meat co-op are all located in this area. Uh, soberingly, uh, food supply for up to 22 million people. This area did not flood during Hurricane Sandy. Um, had it flood, uh, it would have made gas shortages there look like a, a picnic. Uh, imagine the city without, uh, without food, let alone without gas. So it's a very important with you know, for the, for the sake of a turning tide in a few hours, uh, this, this area was spared. But it won't necessarily be spared next time because it's not ready. Uh, it is vulnerable. There's vulnerability at several levels, including um, the most obvious, which is the storm surge, uh, flooding uh, from behind, uh, and, and uh, associated power loss. The power grid is not very robust in that area. And then reduced truck access. This area is accessed primarily through trucks, so goods and produce come uh, uh, to the market in and out uh, by way of the truck network. Uh, and the uh, threat is about disruption of service. Up to $5 billion in the annual economy flows through here, and 20,000 jobs are dire directly uh, attributed to the area. So there's a lot at stake. Um, this area is a working waterfront uh, and not so working community. <laughs> Um, and very much not a working ecology. So the goal is to really look at many levels, many layers of this equation, uh, including the idea that this place needs to operate all the time for its function and its purpose of uh, food markets. It has to do in an environment where the community is engaged. The community uh, is uh, under-engaged now, uh, and uh, the, uh, th that's a problem. It's a problem coming into this. And the, the ecology is just... Is just uh, uh, not a priority here. So our proposition was really about gaining traction in many areas, including, of course, at the base level, the flood protection, protect this place from, uh, from, from impact uh, and, and make it resilient, but also um, understand that there's, uh, people, there are people here and there are people who uh, make their livelihood here. Uh, there are people who depend on this place to operate and work um, through emergency uh, supply chain issues. So the term lifeline, we, we coined the, the, the project uh, name lifeline because we do believe it is about lifelines through the project. Um, as an engineer, I am extremely focused on the idea of providing um, uh, mitigation for risk, and that is, uh, comes to a head when we talk about flooding and, and uh, adaptation for climate change. Um, 
we need to concern ourselves with the probability that something might happen, and uh, that's often expressed in terms of a percentage of risk. The 100-year storm that we talk about is not a storm that happens every 100 years. And if we had it last year, it doesn't mean we've got 99 years to go before we have to worry about things. It's actually a colloquialism of, of, a, of a risk factor, and that factor is a 1 in 100 percent chance that that a 1 in 100 chance, excuse me, a 1 in 100 chance that that event will happen again this year or the next year or the following year. In any given year, it has a 1% chance of happening. So if we look at our challenge here at Hunts Point as solely flood protection, we're concerning ourselves with a 1% risk and a 1% event. We're actually saying we don't care about 99% of it. We're only concerned about the 1% that our mission is focused on. But we really have to consider this a 100% place. It has to work not only just during the flood, but it has to work every other day of the year. And that's a challenge in an area like this where, where things aren't so ideal and, and, and business is challenging. And that very lifeblood that flows through there is the source of, of much concern on a day-to-day -day basis without flooding. So these issues need to be factored into our equation. We have to make this place work all the time. It's about... So our proposal is about keeping the, uh, the faucet open with regard to the food supply. But it's also about a mutual prosperity plan. It's about the economic and social value that this activity provides, and that's an underutilized asset in the community. And of course, we need to do it in environmentally sound and perhaps articulate through educational aspects uh, of a new idea about land and uh, NC. So social resilience emerges, not just physical emergence, uh, not just physical resilience. The point is that if people are adapted, adaptable and adaptive and resilient, um, then that will be half the battle. But it can't just be during a storm event. It can't just be uh, that particular point in time. It really has to be about every day. <clears throat> Our proposal for Hunts Point included the, uh, the, the, the requisite amount of stuff we needed to do, but we wanted to do this and propose this in a way that added value to the community when that storm event did not happen. Clearly, we need to protect the uh, operation of the place and the physical assets uh, so that it does operate during these uh, infrequent events. But for the more frequent day-to-day, -day, it involves a different layer of consideration. And that includes um, protecting from floods, uh, respecting the need for livelihoods for the place, to create, to create a clean, uh, what we call a clean way, which is uh, urban infrastructure that uh, helps cleanse the environment, uh, and to respect the, the, the very unique assets of this place to be uh, a marine, to include a marine maritime supply chain. Um, the flood protection ideas uh, are engineer solutions. They, um, uh, on face value, could have just been about uh, levee wall, levees and walls and barriers, as is done in many other places. Uh, but we really for saw that uh, as, as a, as a uh, missed opportunity to do simply that. Instead, what we want to do is we want to increase the value of the place itself by providing amenity to, uh, to folks, not just, um, not just to protect them from that infrequent storm event, but to provide a place that is much better than it is today every other time. So providing opportunities for uh, community programs within the flood protection scheme, uh, site access and, and uh, barrier-free uh, um, protection, so to speak, um, providing uh, much-needed community assets so that the community could be re reinforced by the investment in this place. We're really talking about putting money into this place, a lot of money. So why would we just build walls and levees? Let's build places. Let's build places that people can learn. People can learn about what happens in our natural environment. Uh, people can learn about the very unique coastal structures that uh, have long been depleted but perhaps could be recreated and restored and that these places become a, a unifying element for the community, uh, not just a path around this, uh, not just the protection aspects itself, but a way for people to understand their neighborhood uh, and, and all of the neighborhood, not just the coastal shoreline, not just the, uh, the pathways and the bikeways, but the, the activity that goes on there and the importance of that, that activity to the community and to the, the city, the greater city itself. The idea that as we reinvent urban fabric through design, that we can make places that provide, at worst, least impact and at best help clean our environment. Landscapes that can cleanse water and air, um, vital parts of, of, a, of a modern strategy about creating urban place. Uh, so much uh, need for green in the urban fabric 
uh, but that green can be asked to not just be aesthetic, but also to be performative and function as cleansing mechanisms for urban pollution of water and air. So given, for example, the idea that trees can help clean the air uh, and absorb stormwater, this is what green infrastructure is. It's about understanding that in, na in nature, the landscapes excel at uh, uh, dealing with some of these, these challenges uh, of our urban living. So we're learning how to leverage design, through design the idea that um, design can contribute to making the place ecologically better, but also uh, socially and economically uh, justified at the same time. Uh, underpinning this uh, entire operation is this idea that we need to, um, is a very unique uh, proposition where um, there's an energy grid that's very uh, deficient in the area and the grid itself is at risk. So to provide resiliency within the grid means uh, to, do, to provide a level of self-sufficiency. And here we're proposing that a, uh, a tri-generation facility be, uh, be proposed where heating, cooling, and power are provided uh, on-site within the district so that, if you will, an eco-district approach towards infrastructure can be used uh, to help um, make the place itself more resilient from an infrastructure point of view, which is pivotal to providing not only flood protection but also continuation of service uh, into, uh, into storm events, through storm events. Um, why do this? Well, there's a real strong and environmental uh, as well as economic ethos to this, and that is that uh, our, our cost consultants estimate that there's a 1.6 benefit to cost ratio when you consider the, uh, the value of the investment and the, uh, the possible downtime and loss of property uh, avoided damages uh, equation. So literally talking about billions of dollars in play here um, as, as being a very, serious, um, uh, a very serious scenario but also a very precarious economic situation that could be upset by, by a devastating effect of a storm. So that's our that's our proposal for uh, Hunts Point. This project went on to we win, uh, win sorry win one of the uh, awards for continuing, and we're receiving grant money to continue the uh, community engagement and planning process, so that uh, this uh, can the, this uh, strategy can be advanced uh, through this project. So we're quite happy about that. So uh, with my second example, I want to shift gears, <clears throat> and I want to talk about um, an engineering project. And I want to talk about engineering project uh, not as an engineer, but as someone who appreciates what uh, landscape architecture can bring uh, to our built environment. Um, this is the city of Cleveland. This is a project we've done that's associated with the city's combined sewer overflow mitigation project. And that's a mouthful. What it means is essentially that the, when it rains, the rivers, I'm sorry, the, the uh, storm drains are connected into the what's called sanitary sewage. And that uh, water combines and overflows because the capacity of the, the treatment plant is exceeded and that raw untreated stormwater and wastewater mixed together is discharged into the lake. And why is that significant? Well, it's very significant in Cleveland because the intake water for the, that you drink, the, the municipal intake water, is located in Lake Erie and the effluent from these overflows are also Lake Erie. So we are essentially looking at taking water from the lake, using it, and disposing it back into the lake. So this is a very precarious balance that has to be established, and it's centered on the idea of, of water quality and, and, of course, clean water. So to that end, the uh, regional sewer district, who is responsible for the uh, sewage overflows here, uh, entered into a consent order with the U.S. EPA to essentially clean up the combined sewer problem. And the way that uh, the city or the, the sewer district proposed to do this was through what we call gray infrastructure. And that is a traditional engineered solution. In this case, it's uh, deep tunnels where the combined sewage overflows instead of flowing into the lake. That volume of water and, and sewage is held, it's discharged into an underground tunnel system. Very large diameter tunnels, 20 feet in diameter or more, uh, where this water is essentially diverted into. And after the storm uh, subsides, that water is pumped back into the treatment plant. So this is a temporary hold uh, storage scenario. <clears throat> Other cities uh, do very similar things. Uh, Providence has done that uh, and, and Boston over the years have, have done various versions of that. Uh, many uh, many uh, hundred plus year old uh, cities have combined sewers and this is a problem across the, uh, uh, across the uh, urban fabric, particularly in the Northeast. So it's a very common problem. Um, so I tell you all of that by, by way of background because the, uh, the investment is, is a total of $3 billion, and that's billion with a B. 
and it involves 70, model, 70 miles of tunnels and pipes uh, and the various access points that are needed to construct and to get at those, those locations. Um, our job was to really look at how uh, green infrastructure, that is um, uh, another approach towards water quality, and uh, perhaps a competing approach towards water quality enhancement in a combined sewer district such as this, how that could be leveraged against the investment in gray infrastructure. And I'll explain what that means. The, as I mentioned, the tunnels uh, that are proposed, the 70 miles of tunnels, will have, um, that will, they will need to get at them. They will need to construct them. And to do that, they, they build these 30-foot or so diameter tunnels, uh, shafts, I should say, that are vertical, uh, essentially holes in the ground that go 400 feet deep. So this on the left, you see a, a, a shaft construction site um, and equipment, including very large tunnel boring machines, are dropped into the shaft, and that's where the tunnel goes, and that's where the, the dirt and rock comes out. So these access points need to be located within the community. The, the condition that uh, is typically done is the one on the right, which is when you're done, you're just going to you know, pave it over and uh, put a fence around it or some bollards and um, call it a day. Um, so we, we looked at opportunities for how these areas could be enhanced. Uh, in section, in kind of a schematic idea here, we're really looking at <clears throat> the, um, the shaft system, the tunnel shaft system that's uh, proposed as a very focused and singular solution for the combined sewer problem. Um, by definition, it's about fixing that problem, and that's why it's, it's been accepted as the, as the alternative to uh, pursue. Uh, it protects the lakes and the streams. This technology is very uh, tested, tried, and true, um, and it does the job. It does the job of mitigating the flooding and protecting the streams and the lake, and that's all it does. That's all it's supposed to do. So if we really parse the picture, we par parse the, the picture a little bit um, and, and, and pick it apart, uh, the real problem with combined sewers comes from the land. It's the urban fabric itself, and that land sheds water because it's, it's been paved. Uh, urban fabric, uh, uh, urban development prevents water from stormwater, rainwater, from getting into the ground and being taken up by plants. If we have building roofs and parking lots, that water is being shed directly into our drainage systems, in the case of a combined sewer, into our sewage systems. So the real culprit, if you will, is actually the, the urban density and the urban fabric itself. Green infrastructure is an alternative, and when we think about the effect of green infrastructure, you can look at cities like Philadelphia who are taking a different approach. Philadelphia is taking an approach where if the problem, if the problem is identified as one of the land cover itself, let's not concede that the land cover is always going to shed, uh, uh, run off into our sewer systems and create a problem. Let's peel back the, la the, the layer of that onion a little bit and let's say that that problem is in the land and the land needs to change. So in Philadelphia, green infrastructure is being proposed as a way of promoting permeability in urban fabric uh, while, while uh, mitigating the combined sewer problem. We will not have the runoff that goes into the sewers in the first place if we take care of the land. So this is a hybrid approach in, in Cleveland. This is a project we call Green Over Gray, and this really illustrates what we're, what we're accomplishing. We're certainly still uh, uh, acknowledging the need and the, uh, the aggressive uh, intentions of the combined sewer mitigation strategy with the deep tunnels, but what we're saying is if we can if we can put back the conditions that are more like natural systems working in the environment, then we will probably be more successful at telling a larger story. The the green infrastructure solutions essentially are natural systems that are designed to repair the land, uh, to manage the water that falls on that land, and to demonstrate the investment in clean water that the combined sewer mitigation strategy um, proposes. So essentially punctuating the idea that this place is important because it holds a three billion, part of a $3 billion investment that you pay for in your sewer bill. You, you now have a new sewer bill that, that capitalizes this. You're going to wonder what it's going towards. Well, what's, what it's for is everything that's underground that you can't see. We're suggesting that there's an educational opportunity to, to let people know why we need to do this, and that's part of the strategy with green infrastructure. So by looking at this kind of holistically, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing that these sewer changes and these proposals for, for infrastructure, for the gray infrastructure, really become uh, punctuations for uh, making improvements to the, to the community itself. So as we have climate change, and this, this issue 
uh, becomes more severe, and that will happen with increased precipitation, this issue will become worse and worse and worse, that we're actually looking to the land itself to help uh, ameliorate the problem. And we're also looking for the, the opportunity gained by these investments, this $3 billion investment, and really reinforcing the social fabric that comes along with it. Looking then at uh, areas such as the Doan Brook Basin, which is the next uh, construction that's coming up in the next five years, uh, and, and zooming into uh, looking through the lens of economic potential, uh, community aspects, economic, uh, I'm sorry, ecological potential, economic opportunity, uh, and looking at the physical context as well as the, uh, the site conditions to understand what designs are appropriate in different areas. And our strategy is to look at the, um, through the center of the slide here, you see from running from top to bottom, you see the storm, uh, these combined sewer tunnels that are proposed, and the dots represent the points of, of, of impact, so to speak. So we look at those points of impact and say, what can we do there? What can we do there? All things considered to help um, not only tell the story about the, the infrastructure in the community, but also use community assets uh, to help reinforce the fabric of the community itself, investment in the community. Strategies include, um, it, our strategy included the triple bottom line approach, which is three layers. Each site will be looked at uh, through three lenses, ecological services, community space, and economic opportunity. Um, all the sites get at least the ecological service layer because all sites are not created equal. There are areas on this slide where investment is being focused in Cleveland right now, and those areas become economic uh, factors. There are areas where people uh, either can go or will want to be drawn to, which become social centers. So we're looking at strategies that, that rebuild community at the same time, uh, taking care of the environmental uh, concerns. So what does this mean? It means things like what would happen at uh, University Circle. And the, uh, the recreation of this space uh, has little to do with sewers. However, it's, a, it's an urban design challenge. And the urban design challenge, uh, there's a solution here proposed that leverages green infrastructure and really requires green infrastructure to happen at the same time we're reinventing the kind of community in that area. Uh, and, and there's a whole host of justifications for, for this approach. Uh, but the point is we're not separating out ecological performance, water, um, economics, or people. It's all the same thing and it's all in play all at once. So truly the triple bottom line is, is about all of it. It's not about three things. It's really about just keeping all of it in focus, keeping your eye on the ball, and thinking about that when you design. So that when you're designing, your design encourages the richness and inherits the value uh, of, those, of those parts. Um, this is a site where, this is a landfill site in Lake Erie. This was a, um, uh, one of the areas within the study area that would be impacted. Um, very interesting story of how this place was created. Uh, it's actually the dredge spoils from the most recent uh, uh, dredging of the Cuyahoga River uh, and uh, was formed by the sinking of two surplus freighters here about in the upper right, 1963. And that became the basis for the landfill, uh, which was done around it. But this area is very, very much an emergent landscape. Uh, and it's, it's a successional landscape that's beginning. It's only a few years old, probably 15 years old now. Um, and we're suggesting that there's ways of uh, increasing the ecological value by providing uh, a, a variety of amenity uh, here that doesn't exist from a landscape point of view. Um, so that would, be, that would be an improvement there. In other areas, there are economic dead zones. In the middle of the, uh, on, with the purple slide there, the purple part of the slide, you see the red dot, red and white dot in the center. The, this particular site is located along uh, uh, Euclid Avenue, which if you know Cleveland, um, the Cleveland Clinic is located in University Circle. Downtown is located in the purple blob to the, uh, to the, to the west, or if you will, to the left of there. So these two areas are kind of economic centers that are meeting in the middle. And there's this, this vac vacant part in the middle of several blocks. And it's along a new corridor that they call the Health Line, which is a bus rapid transit um, uh, uh, facility. So it's an economic cor corridor, uh, economic development corridor. Um, but it is, uh, this area is particularly under, underappreciated and, and certainly underutilized. Uh, we envision that there's uh, green infrastructure solutions that will help um, repair the kind of ecological value, help the sewer problem, but also provide kind of the placemaking and the, 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 reason, uh, the reason to be there uh, in this area. And that this would, could become, this development that's proposed could, could become uh, a social center uh, as well as have the ecological asset that, uh, that is a requisite. And we've even looked at um, the, the very present uh, vacant land that's there. 
a lot of vacant land in some of these neighborhoods, um, <clears throat> and that it's a real problem uh, for uh, stewardship, uh, stewardship of the land. So the, the local, uh, the, I should say the state has created a land bank trust that uh, is now uh, taking these properties over, and we're suggesting typologies that um, uh, provide more value through uh, vacant land holding. And this is, an area, this is an area that's very much in the forefront in Rust Belt cities that are contracting, Philadelphia included. Uh, Philadelphia's come up with strategies uh, to, uh, to deal with their vacant land in a way that makes uh, it look like somebody lives there even though no one does. And that's really important to, uh, to, to reinforce the, the, the idea of community in these areas. Of course, these areas would also provide the stormwater facilities and the ecological values uh, would be enhanced uh, through design. Um, and then there are more formal examples uh, in particularly impacted area, this particular impacted area. This is an underutilized park. It becomes an important linchpin in the continuation of the park development in Cleveland. Uh, but it's actually a reason to come into this area. The, the construction of the sewers is a reason to come into this area and reinvest in the park uh, and, and really take it up a notch. So it would provide uh, a, a park amenity unlike anything that's out there and hopefully be an attraction for, for folks. Similarly, at uh, a transit stop, transit-oriented development uh, located on the uh, Regional Transit Authority uh, line, uh, another investment because it's impacted by the sewer construction. So that's, that's Cleveland. I want to go to a, a built project example, and this is a project that we just finished construction on in, uh, I guess it was, two, well, it was 2012. So it's uh, two years ago this winter. And uh, it's, it's called Washington Canal Park, and it is a uh, park that is created, was created on the location of the old Washington, Washington Canal system. And this canal actually went from the deep water branch of the Anacostia River, where the red box is shown, this area is called the Navy Yard, and it's where actually the old the Navy had uh, uh, had and still has a presence, uh, because the ships could get up into the deep water the, there. To the to the left, you have the Potomac River, and the Potomac River is not navigable; it's shoaly and very shallow. So the canal system used to go from the Navy Yard area through the city right up to the base of Capitol Hill, and this actually is where the Capitol is located here, and the canal used to go right in front of it. Um, there is nothing left anymore, but this is a picture of, uh, of the canal construction at the same time the Capitol Dome was being constructed. Um, the not the last time the scaffolding was on it, but close to it. Um, so uh, a remnant. Um, very, there's nothing left. There's, there's no uh, vestige of, of the canal system that's there. Um, our design for the park, uh, you'll see in a minute, evokes the idea of the canal, but this is the condition that we're, we're dealt with. The area is part of the Navy Yard redevelopment plan, and the, so an economic uh, uh, template exists for the development in this area. And the park was seen as a pivotal um, structure for uh, supporting that development, and pivotal in, in a number of ways. Um, the condition of the three city blocks, here you see two of them in front and one is behind us, uh, was a brownfield, an urban brownfield, contaminated soil, uh, and just used as a bus parking lot for the city of uh, Washington buses. So it uh, could use some improvement. Uh, our design for those three blocks, and the two blocks that you saw are the, the center block and the leftmost block, <coughs> called the uh, north is to the left, so north block, mid block, and south block on the right. Um, our design included uh, uh, evocation of the old canal system through a unifying design structure. And that, that's located on the uh, north, I'm sorry, the east side here, uh, that begins as a, uh, a structure in landscape, uh, bounded on two sides by granite walls, developing into a more formal form uh, of a canal system where water is expressed on the surface and uh, architecture punctuates as if it were barges, continuing into the south block where there's a variety of programming and richness to the site. Um, this is a tavern building, this is a skating rink, jet fountains and so on we'll talk more about in a minute. But unifying all of this is this idea that there's this structure that provides a visual uh, cue to what used to be here and also an int interpretation opportunity for uh, remembering the canal. Here's an aerial photograph of the first year that it was, uh, was built. And you can see that uh, unifying structure along the side of the road here. Um, and you'll see more, more shots of it. But essentially, it's a, it's a presence that develops as the park itself develops in intensity from north to south. And this was our intentional design. Here you see a, a part of the canal with a rain garden. This is a rain garden here, 
part of a green infrastructure strategy I'll touch on in a second. But now you see a, a water, this is a scrim fountain and the children's play fountain, um, where the architecture punctuates that, that structure. As I mentioned on the south block, it includes a very, this is where all the activity is. This is closest to the new um, uh, U.S. Department of Transportation building, uh, located uh, opposite the south block, to the right of the slide here. But uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here, including having a, uh, a skating loop, which is a sheet of ice plus two lobes, uh, and a fountain, a jet fountain around it. So here you see the fountain, uh, and surrounding that in the winter is a permanent uh, skating rink, which uh, they turn on in the winter and uh, becomes a skating rink. It's not brought in, it's actually part of the design of the park. So here's, here's the skating loop. Um, you can see the first year uh, trees are not particularly mature here, but um, Essentially, the, uh, the idea of the jet fountain works year-round, um, and then the skating loop is done. And this is a concession. This is a tavern, uh, tavern building where you can get a, get a dinner or lunch and have a, have a drink. Uh, skate concession where you can rent skates. Highly popular, highly programmed place. Um, that infrastructure system includes, I should say, that uh, canal system includes a heavy dose of green infrastructure. And in fact, that's pivotal. That's the, the linchpin of all of this with regard to how we engage the community's uh, value within the community as well as social uh, amenity. Um, this feature known as the rain garden is actually part of a, uh, a water uh, cleansing mechanism that is designed to receive water from the park as well as the adjacent parcels which have yet to be developed uh, and providing the mechanism for managing stormwater and the reducing the combined sewer overflow discharge. Uh, so water is collected on the site either through the streets, the park, or the adjacent buildings uh, filtered and then stored for, um, for uh, further cleansing through the landscape. Water is moved from here up into the rain garden where the rain garden uh, filters the water and then the water is stored again and that water then is pulled back into um, use and it's used for toilet flushing, irrigation, fountain makeup and the um, ice skating rink water. So basically all the non-potable water is used is using uh, the storage, uh, stored rainwater from, from the project. So this, this whole mechanism is kind of a holistic green infrastructure idea about how um, the, this place can work. Uh, it can reduce the discharge from the, into the combined sewers, but it can also be an economic engine for the future development of these parcels that are around it. And there's value to this, the value to the buildings that are, are nearby and, and will attach to this. Uh, is that they, they can provide, uh, they don't have to do their own stormwater because it's already provided for them. That was part of the value equation of the park from the beginning. Uh, and I just love showing this slide because it shows how difficult all of this is to do for real. Uh, Will mentioned uh, construction details and, and things like that. There you go. Uh, this is a building information model that the contractor used um, that shows the, the uh, 27 geothermal wells under the uh, hundreds of uh, mini pile foundations for the skating rink. The yellow lines are the chiller lines for the uh, skating rink, uh, as well as the blue for the jet fountain and the purple for the stormwater reuse system. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and I bring that to your attention not as background. I bring that to your attention as background for my, for my last few points here. And that is that we designed Canal Park to perform. We designed it to perform at uh, an ecological level, an environmental level, social level, and an economic level. Triple bottom line. Um, we have intentions for this design, which is to save X number of gallons of water. You can look at the statistics. Uh, a certain amount of energy using geothermal wells, et cetera, et cetera. This is what design is about today. It's about understanding impact, in my opinion. Um, there are specific objectives that we see, <coughs> including certification under sustainable design programs such as the Sustainable Sites Initiative and the LEED program. This program has been certified as a sites pilot project as a three-star level, the second highest level that's available, uh, as well as a LEED Gold project for the uh, Tavern Insight. Uh, again, just sustainable sites, sustainable site scorecard, if you're familiar with this, three stars is, is pretty aggressive. Um, but my story is about learning from what we've done. Um, we had the, the fortune of taking on a research project ourselves through Olin uh, to further our knowledge of our design and how it works. So in order to do that, we put together an aggressive research program that spanned a year. And this included, on, well, I'll tell you what it included. Um, there were many aspects of this research, and we were seeking answers in, in specific areas. 
Uh, we wanted to know how the park was doing socially. We wanted to know um, how people use the park. We wanted to know what worked. Uh, we wanted to know what we learned from this so we might do something different next time. So uh, we embarked on a research program that uh, involved collaboration with external entities, including University of Maryland, and, and the, uh, as well as the local players, but also external, uh, external rating systems such as LEED and sustainable sites as templates of uh, understanding um, uh, performance, uh, as well as other academics. Um, we proposed a, uh, a survey system, as well as a, a written survey, as well as on-the-ground interviews that really dug at three specific areas, three general areas, I should say. Um, what did we need to pursue to understand about the Sustainable Sites Initiative certification? That's what's called sites here in yellow. In red, did we achieve the client? Do we think we achieved the client's interest and goals for the design, which were stated and articulated to us, essentially as a design challenge? And then, from our own design team point of view, we're primarily interested in how do we do. So. With the client's points of view, the client has asked us, to, they essentially engage our services to, uh, with specific intention, such as, does this create and reinforce an open space network between <coughs> Capitol Hill and the waterfront? Does it, does it create spaces for social interaction as well as solitude? Do people of diverse backgrounds feel that they're entitled and, own, and uh, that they're in, embraced and uh, feel ownership of the park? And so forth. So. Um, these are questions that, from the client's point of view, we or should say from the client's uh, perspective, these, these are the things that we were interested in doing. From our own design team point of view, we wanted to understand things like how, you know, how did the skating rink do in the summer? In the, in the, in the winter, it's obvious how it does, but how, how is, it, is it doing, you know, is it hiding okay? Is it essentially getting in the way? Um, is, it, uh, is it the kind of quality of space that we, that we envisioned? Are people using it the way we envision? So all of this is coming into play. And from the sustainable sites point of view, there were specific objectives that we had to make sure we achieved. Did we get X number of this and X number of that? So uh, our, our methodology include interviews, uh, surveys, both face-to-face uh, -face surveys, uh, written surveys, as well as web surveys, um, observations, time-lapse photography, and as well as environmental monitoring. All of this was done. Uh, we did this for 10 days throughout four seasons to get a variety of uh, input. So we, we, we compiled 217 surveys uh, uh, representing over 400 people uh, engaged in the process of fact-finding. And uh, I'd like to just show you a day in the life, what we found, and uh, I'm not sure it's, uh, it's um, earth-shattering, but uh, that sometimes you never know what you're gonna find till you look. So uh, this was, um, I forget what day it is, but it's in the summer. And what we have on the top is a kind of a dot diagram of where we saw people at that particular point in time. This was 9 a.m. These are the observations for the day. And these are some actual pictures of where folks were and what they were doing. So this is kind of time lapsing. This is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, noon. People gathered down by the tavern, the South Block. There's food trucks down there, too, by the way. Heavy emphasis on the South Block, which is what we you know, designed for. And then throughout the day, people are uh, probably seeking shade on this hot day. And now folks are setting up for movie night on the north block on the left. And that's what happens at night, that night. <clears throat> so that place is programmed for uh, activity at night. So, you know, a compilation of what we saw that day, this is, again, snapshots of where people were. You know, tell us, okay, well, people are using facilities. They don't tell us anything about why they're using them or what they think of them. Um, and then we, we, we had the ability to do this four times, a year, four times in the year at different seasons and then look at patterns and maybe, you know, see what conclusions, if any, we could draw from the patterns themselves. Um, but we also um, wanted to understand the metrics, the hard, the hard facts. Um, the environmental metrics, as I mentioned before, were pretty well set. Uh, we had expectations for how the system would perform, so there was environmental monitoring that was done. Social metrics, um, I, w I wouldn't say that we intended, unlike the environmental metrics where we had an agenda for performance, with the environmental metrics we wanted to save X gallons, we wanted to impact uh, energy by X amount and so on. Um, the social metrics were not prescribed per se, um, but we, we, you know, my, my peers, my partners have 
um, aspirations for what the place ought to be when it's designed. And it's a bit like black magic, perhaps, but you know, to their credit, uh, wonderfully talented people who really understand how people engage and interact. Um, the design for that is, to me, as much of, a, of an art as it is anything. Uh, and, and so in order, to, in order to understand social metrics, we can, we can see, we can observe where people are and what they do, but we may not understand why they do it or what it took to get them there to, to do that. Um, but satisfaction, did people like it? Um, what did they like about it? And what would they change? So, you know, some anecdotes, you know, very elegant for a neighborhood park, sexy, no, refreshing. Um, a little green haven of beauty, which is, you know, these are great things to, to hear from people, of course. And I, I guess we would put up the bad things if we had them uh, and own up to them. But uh, it's nice to have uh, people uh, complimenting. But what else did we learn? We, you know, we wanted to learn where people were coming from, how, who were the park users and where, where did they come from. 20% uh, came from three buildings. These are the three largest office buildings uh, in the area. Transportation building being this, this building here. Here's the park. This is the transportation building. It's the highest density of, of workers. So very popular um, draw. And then uh, within walking distance, um, five-minute walk, and then a 10-minute walk. So a lot of folks coming from, you know, from the neighborhood, um, you know, including dog walkers, where they came from where the lunch crowd came from, ice skaters. This was an interesting one because the ice skater draw was um, uh, much broader, much wider than that of the local park user. So the, the, the ice skating uh, facility is actually a regional draw. Um, and then, you know, who's playing there? It's, it's kids uh, with their folks from the neighborhood. <clears throat> and again, just as the, the people, just as people with the, uh, look at the skating rink from a larger catchment area, uh, the fountains were also perceived in the same way, something being very special and very, being very uh, valuable as an amenity. Uh, but, but social interaction, have you made new uh, acquaintances? Is there anything you would change? The number one response was more shade. Obviously, with a new site and immature vegetation, we're not getting a lot of, of, uh, of uh, shade. But interestingly, one of the environmental criteria was heat island effect. And to mitigate that, you put a lot of uh, light-colored pavement in, which tends to increase glare. So I think that might have exacerbated the perception of more shade being needed. Uh, and obviously, with the canopy growth, uh, that, will, that will happen. Um, but then com conversations about style matters. Uh, what do you like most about the park? The modern design, aesthetically pleasing, visually nice, modern, clean, open, tasteful, simplicity. In addition to what people liked about the park, they were asked how they felt in the park. Do they feel safe? Do they feel this place is clean and safe? And the district, uh, the business improvement district, who is the owner of the park, has been taking a survey for the last six years since they've been involved. The question that they've asked every year is, do you feel safe? Is this a clean and safe place? And in the beginning, 16% six years ago, six years before this, 13% um, answered, yes, this is clean and safe. Today, over 90% are answering, yes, this is clean and safe. So that's really social transformation. Um, parks can be common ground. Uh, what is the diversity within the, na within the neighborhood itself, but also what's the representative uh, diversity within the park uh, from a demographic point of view? And there's similarity and alignment. Who do you think the, design was, uh, the park was designed for? Um, by and large, everyone thought everyone, which I guess makes our designers happy because that's what it's about. But then you also have special amenities that, that attract children, for example. We have a children's play area and children, children fountains, um, and that is an intention of design too. Um, do you feel welcome in all parts of the park? And then what's next? Um, this was done as part of an, an outreach um, within the Sustainable Sites Initiative to um, publish our work. Uh, and that uh, partner involved was the Landscape Architecture Foundation through their CSI program. And that is, um, I forget the name of it already, <laughs> something site investigation. Um, but also feedback for the Sustainable Sites uh, certification. Um, we used the information gained, and this is just a snippet of it, but the information gained in our own internal uh, knowledge base, which is pretty robust, uh, and we're also look, using it to build on, uh, you know, building successful projects um, based on some of the ideas throughout here. So, <clears throat> in closing, I believe that, you know, the best design responds to the needs of the place and that people, the economy, and the environment all matter. This is the tri triple bottom line. Resiliency is instilled through smart intelligent design, and it facilitates adaptation, changing futures, right? Depending on whether we can predict them or not, uh, places will change and the smart places will change smartly. 
By understanding the range of future possibilities and designing adaptable systems that work today as well as into the future, we can create places that enhance life, the people, the economy, and the ecology alike, the true tri triple bottom line. So thank you for your attention, um, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Who's first? Nobody. Okay, I can't see you, but please. Just. There I am. Yeah. Um, thanks. That was really interesting. I really liked seeing the way that you did the assessment um, and developed those metrics and, and looked at the way that the project actually performed. I was kind of thinking about that and wondering about it as you went along, so it was great to see that. Um, I'm curious about the cost-benefit analysis that you did for Hunt's Point and if you can provide any more details around how that was done and what factors went into it. And sure. Yeah, we used a, um, a cost, I called them a cost consultant, and they would shoot me if they were here hearing that described that way, an economic development advisory, um, uh, HRA. <laughs> Uh, HR, HRNA, they do a lot of um, development uh, consulting for, uh, for economics. So they did a complete um, economic uh, analysis here of, of the value of the operations, and it was very, very robust. On the cost side, uh, we prepared preliminary concept level designs to understand what the physical impact would be, therefore what the cost would be. But the, really the, the balancing of that was done on the economic value side of the equation, and um, they were uh, very uh, helpful in uh, and, and kind of broadening that conversation to it's really not just about what gets damaged physically, it's about the operations that, that the city relies on and the economic value of that. So if we took, talk about the 100% the place, it's about keeping those operations going 100% of the time, not relying on 99% of the time, and that 1% where it doesn't work. Or the 1% chance that it might get damaged and need to be repaired, that really wasn't the model. It was what is the, what, what's the alternative to this? And the alternative is that... Um, you know, the, the high tide comes through six hours later than Sandy did, uh, and that we're down without food in the city for six, uh, six or seven days. So. Uh, is, the, is that report available? To yeah, it's part of the uh, the rebuild um, the rebuild uh, packages. So, I mean, the summary version of that is included in our final report, but I can refer you to the folks who did that for more information if you'd like. Yes, Tom. Steve, the project where you introduced it as being within a brownfield site yeah. uh, area, what was your approach to mitigate that element? Yeah, the, uh, the brownfield was um, basically urban fill in that area. That, that whole area was the area of the canal, and it, it was all just kind of whatever was in the ground bulldozed. Um, so it, was very, it, wasn't, it wasn't highly toxic. It wasn't hot spot type of um, brownfield contamination. Uh, but it was really about um, encapsulating some of that and removing some of the hot spots where we needed to build um, soil structures, for example, to not rely on the, the quality of the parent soil, uh, but to, to instead bring in soil that we knew would work better and then isolate that from the old soil. So it was about pushing the other stuff off to the side and protecting us, protecting from it in te techniques that are done all the time with regard to uh, uh, barriers and, and uh, permeability capping, so to speak. Um, but then it was about also needing to know what we could use and what we couldn't use, and most of it we couldn't use, so it involved importing, particularly soil materials. So there's a strategy about, and, and if you do any brownfield work, it's really important to understand what is wrong with that place at that point in time, because that's, that, the answer to the question is, it depends on what's in the ground and where it is and what uh, concentrations of pollutants are in there and so on. So it's a very highly site-specific, almost by nature, uh, solution. Yes. Um, I had the opportunity in September to go to the Canal Works Park and had lunch in the tavern. So really Great. really agreeable urban place. Really very Great. nice. Um, so I have some specific questions sure. about details. Sure. I love the benches. Were those custom designed? Yeah. That, that site? Um, you mean the ribbon bench? The ribbon bench, yeah. The ribbon, no, bench. ribbon bench. No. Because oh, the, okay. The long concrete ones. Yeah, uh, well, everything is custom designed here. Um, and I noticed your tree pits, the trees that are actually along the street yeah. are depressed. Yeah. 
So I don't have pictures of either of those. However, um, <laughs> not with, well, in another presentation, if you want to see them later. Um, but uh, yeah, so two things. The benches, what you saw is kind of a, a long U-shaped bench in the middle block, and that middle block is the children's play area. So that U that gets created by that long monolithic bench is actually encompassing the place where parents can watch the kids from three sides, three angles. And one of the things we learned, it, without seeing it, it might be a disadvantage for you, but one of the things we learned is we, we intended this to be the place where parents could sit and watch the kids. And the slides that we saw showed people really weren't going there as much as we thought they would, um, which was curious. <clears throat> so our information was coming back saying, well, people aren't using this quite enough. What's wrong with our design? What went wrong? Well, I went out there one day in the summer and looked, and I went to the bench and sat down. I said, this is wonderful. This is pleasant. And then <laughs> right behind me, the whole the planter behind me had flowering shrubs, and there were a bazillion bees buzzing around. <laughs> That's why nobody wants to sit there, because they'll get stung by bees. So sometimes you don't really connect the dots, so to speet. Um, planters on the street, this is, uh, that's part of the green infrastructure strategy. The, the planters actually are green infrastructure planters. They're depressed uh, below the sidewalk to be able to take the runoff from the street into them, filter that water through, and cr connect into that uh, drainage system. I saw that. So you're, you're selecting species that will tolerate whatever comes That's right. That's right. We want, we want to select, uh, for all of this uh, green infrastructure, we want to select uh, the species that will thrive in that environment of being periodically inundated, uh, and then those will create kind of the best filtering conditions that um, we need to, to treat the water that flows through them. Well, you uh, showed some graphic of the issues for the breakdown for the um, canal park where you had clients. Yeah. Now, I would assume that you're sometimes or always involved in issues of developing a consensus or trying to gauge what the client really wants. And in a situation like this, it seemed like the client was representing the recreational needs of many and the connectivity and the need to make the connections. Are you, are there other clients there who are harder to represent? And if not, in this case, there must be other projects where you end up with your industrial clients who say, hands off, and the community says, hands on. Yeah, so that's a, <laughs> there's a lot in that question. Um, in this particular case, the client had aspirations and they were articulate about it. So our engagement, our selection was based on our uh, response to their stated concerns, that they wanted the park to do these things and other things. So we were selected based on our proposal to, to satisfy those criteria and more. And um, they were a client that knew to ask those questions. There are many clients who don't know to ask the questions or don't care to ask the questions. And um, it's harder to satisfy the client if you don't know what they want. Um, admittedly, you're getting in there to do something for them, to build a park, to build a site, to build a, a landscape. And that's, that's the easy part. The hard part is uh, to do it in a way that, that will benefit them and the users and, and the, the, the stakeholders involved. Um, so I'm not a designer, um, but I know my, my partners uh, really understand how to balance those values of the potential users for the site and the interests of the clients through design. Um, and it's, it's, like I said before, it's to me, it's magic. Um, but it, but it's, it's difficult because you don't want to tip the balance in terms of um, too much on the client and not enough for the public. You know, these, these public places become, um, you know, a, a client project, but the the stakeholder group is larger than the client group. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I wasted a little time. <laughs> yes? Um, I just want to say congratulations on winning the Rebuild by Design. Thank you. And um, what are your plans for, I guess, involving the community in the next step of the planning process? So if you're familiar with Rebuild by Design, there were uh, 10 teams proposing 10 different um, solutions for 10 different problems. Um, and six teams were selected to continue, or, or their projects were, or were selected to continue. Uh, of the six, five of those projects, uh, uh, construction money was committed. 
So um, you have uh, the proposal called the Big U, uh, which is the, the giant wall around Lower Manhattan, uh, the Big U proposed by the Big Team, um, and others. So 500, 600 million here or there, you know, before long it adds up, right? Uh, one project received um, funding for community engagement and continued planning, and that was our project. Because of the, the Richard, who wasn't, Richard Rourke, my partner, who was to be here tonight, but he's on a plane to India, um, and I'm filling in for him. Richard was, uh, was in charge of that, and, and Richard really saw this as a, a means, uh, the project was one of community engagement as much as anything. Uh, and so to, to be successful, the project needed to um, really understand the 99% the of the place, right? Not just the 1%. The 1% was easy. That's what these engineer guys do. Um, but the rest of it is the 99%, and that's, that's the part that was the, the community engagement part, because this was a dysfunctional community. It still is, right? You've got this major, major industrial lifeblood operation happening right next to a community where asthma is a problem, obesity is a problem, food, de a food desert. It's a food desert of all things, where there isn't access to food in the middle of this food market area. So there are some very difficult community questions there. And of course, there's the social economic issues and so on. There's jobs. So this is a dysfunctional community that um, needed to be engaged. And they'd never been engaged together in anything. So it was a matter of um, opening this conversation up beyond putting in the flood wall about how do we enhance the community. And that's really what gained the traction. It was, OK, we need to do something with the obvious, which is protecting against the storm. But to be resilient, we need to, be, we need to have a resilient community. We need to have everybody um, not just working together, but, but living together. And that, so to answer your question, this project was uh, funded to continue the community outreach and um, planning to get to construction. So there was an, enough, enough of acknowledgment that this is really where the effort has to be focused on for the next few years to gain the traction to make the project happen. More questions in the back? Um, clearly, uh, you and Olin uh, place a lot of emphasis on post-project completion uh, analysis, uh, which is refreshing. Uh, my question is, how do you view this information uh, going forward? Is it statistics that you would uh, pitch to future clients uh, when making a presentation, or do you just use it um, in-house to inform uh, your designs? Um, all of the above. I'm looking for the slide that I, well, anyway, um, yeah, all of the above. Um, we have, I, I alluded to a knowledge base. We have a very interesting and a very um, uh, robust knowledge base, which is an internal filing system. But it's a Google type system, Google search based system where we store our project information, but also our, frankly, tips and tricks and experiences and it, we, we actually have a full-time librarian who deals with our digital collections as well as um, uh, the, the, the physical uh, library. Uh, and, and our um, IT team and our, and our librarian data manager um, uh, have put together this knowledge base that we assemble this stuff in. So we can access and we can, you know, somebody wants to know oh, things like, when did we use this last plant species in California? Here's, here, here's where we did it, here are the plans, here are the projects, and so on. But also, you know, what lessons did we learn? Um, when we used black locust here on this project in lieu of tropical hardwood, it's the first time we used that much uh, black locust. So there were other projects that we had researched internally, um, and that became part of our knowledge base. So the information that we accumulate becomes part of our knowledge base. That's, that's part of your answer. The other part is, yeah, we do like to talk about it. We like to tell people about it. This was an investment of our funds and our, our energy um, that we put into learning. So we feel it's fair to be able to get something back, which is um, the experience we gain. Um, but also the, the tangible, I, I would say that the, the coolest part of it, from my point of view, being very analytical, is, is to understand what the data means when you see it. Because there wasn't, you know, for any scientists in the, in the room here, the, the, this wasn't a scientific method approach where we had a hypothesis that we wanted to test and see if the data, you know, pr pr proofed it or rebutted the, the, the hypothesis. This, this was about just let's go find out what's out there and, and what, I don't know what conclusions we can draw, what lessons can we learn from it. So from that point of view, we're finding out things that we never really even appreciated that we needed to know. Um, things like 
where people sit and why. I mean, we, we, I got people in my office that spend weeks designing benches. It's crazy. But you got to design the right bench or else nobody will sit in it. So um, it's all of that stuff. And, and it's pretty cool. And it, to, your, to, your point, to your compliment about us prioritizing post-occupancy and understanding, uh, thank you very much for that. But I'd say this is our first real foray into it. So we're really just starting. Um, we're actually looking for uh, outside funding to be able to continue this for other projects. So we're really excited about the kind of toe that we've put in this water. Um, and where it'll get us. So, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, movable chairs in your in your canal park project, and I wondered uh, how you persuade people uh, that they won't be stolen to go do do them, and or how how do you cope with you know missing a few now and then, or, sure. or do they how do you handle that? You say, don't steal the chairs, um, and hopefully they won't. Um, but you know, interestingly, um, my par founding partner, Lori Owen, uh, had designed Bryant Park in New York City. Uh, we were talking about this at dinner when it was known as Needle Park because of very nefarious activity going on there um, and, and a very dangerous place to be. <clears throat> part of the design was to open it up to make it more porous, to, to have light and uh, sight lines through the, the work of Holly White at the time social scientists understanding the physical form of place matters and things like that. Uh, and, and then the idea of the movable chair and the, the great trepidation about putting chairs out there that somebody could steal. And I guess they do lose them now and then, but after so long you can only have so many free chairs in your apartment. Um, so <laughs> it stops after a while, I guess. Um, but uh, this, the, in, in all seriousness, I think part of it is the maintenance of the park itself, and I don't mean that from a, a who's picking up the trash point of view, but more that there's park managers in play here, and there are people who are hired to be present during, um, the, during the day, and that's from dawn to dusk. Uh, and then the chairs get locked up with the tables at night. They kind of get pulled over, in the, just like you see sidewalk uh, restaurants kind of pulling back at night. So I, I think it's, it's as much a matter of understanding how people work, um, and that if you, let's, if you give somebody an opportunity to steal something and, and don't care about it, then they probably will take advantage of you. But um, I think to be smart about it, um, the management group here um, does have managers who are present and would notice things like that. So uh, deterrent, I don't know, but so far so good. Yep, sorry, can't see you. Okay. So uh, I've had the opportunity to go to Canal Park. Great. Uh, our park can kick their park's butt. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so um, for context, the Yards Park is located on the river, probably a block and a half away from this park. Um, but interestingly, both parks were part of the master plan for the development of the Navy Yard that we're implementing. So it was always envisioned that there would be two parks um, side by side like this. Um, not necessarily in comp, and you're familiar with both, uh, they're different, you know, they're, they're both different. One is the, 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 the uh, Yards Park is really kind of opening to the water and it's really about a riverfront place. This is more of an intimate social, um, a, a more social intimate space. Um, they, they each have their values and differences and I think that makes kind of a nice mix for, for what happens down there. The second part of your question, I forgot already. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the soccer stadium. Yeah, so um, that's all part of the Navy Yard um, plan. And uh, this park actually was justified and funds were raised for it based on the fact that it became a vital part of that plan. Um, and that as a, a, an, an economic amenity for the area, it would provide value for the buildings and, and neighborhood around it. Um, so it, I, I can't speak much for the specifics of that, what will happen in the future, but all of that is part of a, a plan for the Navy Yard District, which is well in the, in the throes of being implemented. So 
It's all all part of the same ball of wax. Well, I think that you have um, answered all the questions for the moment. If any of you have additional questions to ask, I'm sure before Steve leaves, he can answer your questions. In the meantime, I want to say thank you very much for an exciting. Thank you.